Hi, it's Daryl Judy with Washington Fine Properties, and we're another episode of Casa de Amigos with another friend in my house, and it's Bishop Gene Robinson. Hi. So thank you for doing this. I'm delighted. Gene is a friend. Gene is a client. Gene is a mentor. And so um, tell, tell us a little bit about who Gene Robinson is. Who you describe? Well, um, so I really appreciate this apartment because um, I didn't live in a house with running water till I was 10 years old and uh, grew up really, really poor. So I, I feel really fortunate to, to be in this nice place and, and in Washington, D.C. Um, so I grew up in Kentucky, uh, went to college in Tennessee where I became an Episcopalian. And I really became an Episcopalian because ultimately I became a bishop. Um, the Bishop of New Hampshire. Um, I was in New Hampshire, well, I've been in New Hampshire most of my adult life, um, but for the last uh, 10 years of that time, um, I, I um, was the Bishop of New Hampshire. I retired from that and moved to Washington, D.C. in 2013 and worked as a senior fellow at one of the two big uh, progressive think tanks downtown, uh, the Center for American Progress. And then four years ago, was hired to be the vice president of religion uh, and senior pastor at Chautauqua Institution in far western New York. And I just now retired from that. And I'm going to actually be retired, I think. Although I'm going to be doing uh, uh, quite a lot more work up at the National Cathedral. Okay. Yeah. All right. So t tell us a little bit, like you said that you're from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. What did, when you said about, you, I know you didn't have running water, and I, I fortunately did, but my father grew up the same way, right? There was no bathroom in, in the house yeah. growing yeah. up. Um, what was it like? Describe your home in Kentucky. What does home mean to you when you think about Kentucky? So one of the things that I remember is that um, a, a church was basically our social life. Uh, because when you're poor, there's not a lot else you can do. That and um, uh, friends, you know, sitting around the table. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, so those were the early days of television, right? I remember when there were three channels. And, and uh, literally people would come to your house or you would go to their house to watch, um, you know, Imogene Coca and, you know, it, it, some show of, of some kind, uh, which is really kind of funny to think about because we just take it so for granted uh, now. But um, uh, uh, close family, uh, but a lot of work when you're poor. But, but you know, we lived on a farm. So my what mother- What farm? Uh, it was a tobacco farm. Okay. Yep. And the church that I went to, except for one man who was a lawyer, uh, everyone was a tobacco farmer. Um, so. Uh, but we had an enormous garden, and my mother canned everything, and I was like her right hand until I was old enough to help with the tobacco, <laughs> and then my father robbed me from her. Um, so uh, family was uh, super important. Um, I, I had a, uh, a kind of an almost disastrous uh, birth process. I wasn't supposed to live, um, and... Um, they, when they finally gave me to my parents after I was in the hospital for a couple of months as a newborn, um, they told my parents that I would never walk or talk or have any meaningful life, but not to worry because I wouldn't live the year uh, out. So um, anyway, <clears throat> so I became my mother's project. And so when I went into first grade, I was reading at the fourth grade level. Um, only because she just kind of, and I don't know where she found any time to devote to me because she was always working. Right. So it's funny, there, I've watched, you have a couple documentaries about you or you've appeared in a lot of things. You have a very rich life and celebrated. The one thing that um, resonated with me was your perfect Sunday school attendance. Yeah, I, right? still, have the, I still have the little pen it starts out with a, a pen, and then the year two of perfect attendance is a wreath around that pen. And then it starts these bars that you just keep adding to. And I had 13 years, and I'll tell you a funny story about that. Um, 
uh, at one point during that 13 years, I had a Sunday school teacher who didn't care if you were sick, that you missed, and you had to start all over. Well, I was not going to break my perfect record. So I literally um, didn't tell my <laughs> parents that I had measles. I, I, I knew I had measles, but I didn't tell them because I knew they would make me stay home. So I went, so I'd get my attendance, and gave measles to the entire class. Oh my goodness. Those were the days of German measles, and all. I right. mean, it was just unbelievably contagious. It makes COVID look like a piece of cake. Right. Um, so yeah, so 13 years. No, that's so funny because I had the same thing. I forgot that I had those with a circle and then the wreath, yeah. and then another, then another, then. And if I went to my grandmother's, because we didn't have anything. Like we went to our grandma's for birthdays. Yeah. And for, we hung out our cousins. Is your cousins or church? Yep. That's what it yep. was, right? It wasn't anything else. It wasn't country club or anything like that. And we'd go to my grandmother's church, my uncle's church. We'd have to have a pass saying that you were here. And then the next week, I'd take that this oh, I just, uh, <laughs> So I- So you got credit. So you get credit. So I credit. appreciate that so much. Um, so you're Episcopalian now, but that's not where you came from. How, no, I grew transition? up in, in the Disciples of Christ Church. Um, and actually, the, the, this very small rural church that I uh, went to was one of the earliest in the denomination. That, uh, most people here on the East Coast don't know the Disciples Church because it, it began when Kentucky and Ohio were the frontier. And so from there, it moved west as people moved west, but it kind of never um, turned around and, and, and came east. The only Disciples Church that I know of for sure is a National City Christian on Thomas Circle, which, is, which was LBJ's uh, church. Right, right, right. Um, so um, it's, it's actually a really, um, in my estimation, a, a really great uh, denomination. But I fell in love with the rich liturgy of the Episcopal Church and, uh, and the prayer book. Um, I, I, there are, you know, people who don't use such a resource can't imagine why we would say the same words every week and not come up with something new every week. Uh, but uh, I, I find it a great comfort and um, uh, and, and so incredibly beautiful that I just keep finding new things in it. So you become a Episcopalian, you found a place of home there, right? Mm -hmm. um, as you transition, how did your parents respond that you're now becoming an Episcopalian? What was that like? Yeah, so I, I knew that would be heartbreaking for them, partly because, interestingly, I, I am, I think, the sixth generation in that church from the founder. James Robinson was one of the founders. And in each generation, there was only one son. Of course, this, you know, nobody cared about daughters in those days. Right. Well, they did, but... Uh, it, and it, so um, there were varying numbers of daughters in the generations, but only one son. So that was the only way a Robinson stayed in that church. Uh, through all those generations. So when I left, that was the end of it. Um, so I, I knew it would be, it would be tough on them. Uh, and I, uh, so Kentucky, historically, was a very anti-Roman Catholic place, as there were many places like it. It was dry, there was no liquor anywhere, and, um, and it was anti-Catholic, except for three counties where all the Catholics lived and made all the bourbon. So uh, it's just one of those, you know, right. kind of funny things. So the first words out of my parents' mouth were, well, that's like Catholic, isn't it? I mean, we, we thought there were Protestants and Christians and Catholics. Right. You know, we, it never occurred to us that, that Catholics were Christians. Right. So um, uh, once they came a few times, you know, there were, there were things that they recognized. So in the Disciples Church, uh, there's communion every Sunday. Um, and, and there is in the Episcopal Church. So uh, they, they, when they saw that, they, they recognized it. Feels like home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. How would you describe that? But it's interesting because your parents fascinate me. Longevity, right? You're, you're yeah, my dad just died at age 96 last May. Um, and three months before he died, he was as healthy as could be, 
he was, you know, uh, uh, run, take, running his own affairs, uh, living independently, driving better than I do. Um, and then just when he went down, he went down fast. And so there's just a, there was a lot to celebrate. I miss him, of course. Right. And uh, I got to see the trajectory of his life. He had quit high school uh, to go into the Second World War in 1943. And, uh, and he went back and got his GED diploma. And I attended my own father's graduation from high school. I was 12 years old. And, um, and I just, I remember being so proud of him. And then I graduated from that high school six years later. Hmm. So, so definitely a role model. What would you say has been your biggest lesson from your father? Like the thing that you learned the most? So I, uh, people tend to get more and more conservative as they get older. Um, he started out really conservative. Mm -hmm. and racist and misogynist and all, all the isms that you, sh you don't want to be. Um, and over the trajectory of his life, he became the most wonderful human being. People adored him. He became so kind. So with that history, um, he, got, he got onto the fire department, which is how he got out of farming. And uh, and it was my dad, racist, misogynist dad, who brought people of color and women onto the fire department in Lexington, Kentucky. And, uh, and I remember going home in 2009, and he was in a rage over how Republicans were treating Barack Obama. And I, I was like, who, who took my father away and left this thing here that looks like him? But it sure doesn't sound like him. So what I learned is that uh, you, you can just, you can get better and better and better. And uh, we don't have to be what we are right now. We can become something better. That's good. And, and I, I saw it in living color, you know. Um, I, I, I saw the transformation. So your storied life, right? So I had had you over for dinner maybe a week or two weeks ago. Yeah. And I had friends who came in who I didn't, I didn't say, this is coming to dinner. And I'm, I'm going to introduce you. I'm like, oh, Bishop Jean, we met one other time. So there's a reason why people know you more than probably normal bishops, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, um, I was a priest in the Diocese of New Hampshire. And um, in the Episcopal Church, the, the process for choosing a bishop uh, is very democratic. Uh, a diocese um, can can call any priest to to be their bishop, and uh, and it has to be agreed upon by a majority of the clergy and a majority of the laity, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, I was elected uh, uh, bishop in my diocese, and I had been the assistant to the bishop for eighteen years, actually, and and so everybody knew me, and. And I had been in their congregations doing work. Well, um, and then, so I was elected, and the, and the world exploded, much to my diocese's uh, shock, because I'm an openly gay man, partnered, all of that. And, uh, and, and it turns out I'm, I was the first openly gay man uh, uh, made bishop in Christendom. So, uh, so it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it just, I still can't get over the honor of it, and um, uh, it was just a wonderful thing. Um, but, you know, it was the right diocese for me to be elected in because no one could accuse my diocese of, like, doing it just to make a point. Uh, they knew me inside and out and, and wanted me to be their bishop. So they were incensed when both the Episcopal Church in this country and the Anglican Communion around the world uh, went, uh, went crazy. Right, yeah. Nuts. Like, if, you know, if a church could have its head explode, that's what was happening, like all over. In fact, uh, right, right around here, um, uh, over in Northern Virginia, Falls Church, that mm -hmm. area, uh, was, a, was a center for opposition to my... Um, uh, consecration. And it's, you know, sitting here in 2022, it's hard to remember um, 
what 2003 was like and how, how far we've come. You know, with, uh, there was still, uh, you know, no gays in the military, don't ask, don't tell, no gay marriage. Uh, and, uh, and most of uh, religious, certainly um, Christians, uh, Muslims and more conservative Jews and so on, you know, still considered it a sin. And in fact, um, I was elected on the 7th of June in 2003, and three weeks later, um, sodomy was declared legal. It, that was Lawrence v. Texas with the Supreme Court. Um, and the guy who argued that case, uh, I now know here in, in D.C. But literally, when I was elected bishop, uh, me and my partner were illegal in about 12 states. So, I mean, that's how far we've come, right? And um, so about 100,000 people left the Episcopal Church uh, because I was going to be a bishop of a little tiny backwater diocese, you know, in New England. But nevertheless, um, it was, yeah, it was a big deal. So uh, I, I began to live uh, uh, two lives. One was this perfectly normal bishop's life in a diocese. Mm -hmm. Um, where, where no one understood very well what was happening to me outside. And then I would leave the diocese, and I, then I became this other person. You know, I'm on The Daily Show and, the, and Colbert and 60 Minutes interviews and, you know, um, and, and doing this other thing, which was um, being the first. Actually, the... Uh, I, I met Barack Obama during the um, um, primaries, of course, because first in the nation primary is in New Hampshire. And uh, he and I had a fantastic relationship, uh, a fantastic conversation. Well, I think we had a nice relationship, too, but um, about being the first. It was just him oh, and me right. and a couple of uh, Secret Service people. And, uh, and we talked about how... Uh, how stressful that was and hard, you know, we both got death threats. And I, I when I was consecrated a bishop at, at that big service, I wore a bulletproof vest. I was getting daily death threats for um, actually a couple of years. And, uh, but, Very but Christian like, he, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to love those Christians, right? Uh, who love the church enough to kill a bishop over it. So um, it was, uh, it was uh, quite the time, and he and I shared one experience, which was that it was actually harder on our families than on us, because hmm. we're out there like doing it, right? right? And you're just putting one foot in front of the other, trying to do the next right thing. But your family's wondering if you're going to get shot. Um, and so in some ways, it was uh, harder on them um, uh, than on that on us. So he and I always shared that. And then he honored me with um, asking me to pray the opening invocation at the um, uh, first inaugural event at the Lincoln Memorial. Right. And, yeah. So, and that was, and, and then invited me to sit on the platform uh, uh, with him, with them uh, when he was uh, sworn in. So to walk out of the Capitol uh, and look at two million people on the mall was Insane. breathtaking. Right. Absolutely breathtaking. It was also colder than kraut, as my father would say. Right. It was just, um, uh, but a remarkable experience. You know, I was I was on that stage as well. I was fortunate enough to be there, up top where you were. Free. It was the coldest day of my life. Unbelievable. Coldest day and one of the most amazing days. I never heard. Uh, uh, a sharp or angry word spoken the whole day. It was, and, and there were just people jammed in everywhere, everywhere. Right. everywhere. But yeah, it was, it was quite astounding. Do you think that that's part of what your life was and how you, what you went through transformed your father? You know, we never talked about that. Um, no, I, no, that transition had, had uh, certainly begun and was well 
on its way okay. um, before that. I mean, all of what he did with the fire department. I mean, he, you know, he was retired for 30 years, right? So, um, so yeah, he had done all of that before, long before I was consecrated a bishop. Uh, but he just kept getting better and better. Right. And I, one of the things I remember about my parents is that um, it didn't matter who was sick or what they were sick from in our church, they would go visit them, either at home or in the hospital, not because somebody told them they had to or should, just because those are the kind of people they were. Right. So I, I don't want to go into all the details of your life because you, there's documentaries. So the name of the documentary, if people want to learn more about you. So the first one was uh, For the Bible Tells Me So which is the second line of Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Mm -hmm. um, and it's about five families, uh, religious families, in which one of the children comes out as gay. Uh, and the second one, uh, uh, both went to Sundance. The second one was in 2012, and uh, it's called Love Free or Die. And it begins... Um, uh, with the Lambeth Conference of Bishops, a worldwide uh, conference of bishops in England that happens every 10 years. And since its inception in the 1860s, I think, um, every bishop has always been included. And I was not invited. So um, I went anyway. Uh, I didn't go any place I wasn't welcome, but I just stood on the outside uh, reminding all those people inside who opposed me that there were people at home just like me at where they lived uh, sitting in their pews um, and, and they couldn't ignore me and they couldn't ignore them. So that's how that, that film begins and it, and it kind of culminates uh, at the uh, inauguration of Barack Obama. Right. So, I would, I, so I've watched that. I watched it again just preparing for this. That one tore me to pieces, the England, going to England, and, and you know, I knew the consecration and the, the bulletproof vest and the anger at that moment in time, but to see it continue on and on, and um, what is it that got you through that moment? Like, how did, like, where did you find that oomph? So, um, I have a, a had uh, and have a, a spiritual director who really, really helped me. And she taught me a technique which stood me in such good stead. Um, you know, uh, I did uh, uh, several interviews with Terry Gross, and I mentioned this in one of the interviews with her, and she just became completely fascinated and wanted to hear all about it. And the interview, the whole thing turned out to be about this. But quickly, it's, um, uh, she would have me uh, sit quietly, close my eyes, hands on my knees and, um, and imagine God's love uh, pouring, starting at the top of my head and pouring over me like warm butter. Mm. And she said, I don't want you to say anything. I don't want you to, uh, when you find yourself you know, making your grocery list um, for later, just go back to this place and, and remember uh, how much God loves you, and and if you've got that, then everything else is small potatoes. And that's what got me through, was that technique. But but getting in touch with the thing that got me through, which was, um, I knew that God loved me, uh, and you, and everybody else, uh, but me, uh, and nobody could take that away from me. And, and getting shot and killed w wouldn't have taken that away from me. Right. So um, it, it put everything in perspective, like that's really important and all this other stuff isn't so much. Right, right. So we're in your home right now taping and we're fortunate to be neighbors. I live next door. And... Um, so I think about what my home is. My home is next door. I have a home in Virginia. I go to Pennsylvania. That's my family home, right? Uh, my home is a Methodist church, Foundry Methodist, yep. right? So it, it, to be rejected by that is pretty insane, right? 
So what is it, what's the, what's the bright light now in terms of the Episcopalian Church and how they've transformed and they're, they're more willing to make home for other people and a safe place? How would you describe what it was 19 years ago versus what you experienced today? Yeah, uh, and, and I'll start by saying, uh, you know, growth is always painful uh, because growth always involves giving something up and grieving over it, right? And uh, people were fearful, really fearful, that the church they had known and loved their whole lives, you know, that they'd buried their parents out of and married their children and all right. that was gonna change and never, never be the same again. And um, so that really um, uh, shaped the Episcopal Church. Uh, and yet somehow, when it came, uh, my consecration had to be uh, consented to uh, by a majority of the clergy and the laity, uh, and uh, it turned out to be consented by two thirds of each of those groups. No one, including me, had any idea that that would be the case. We thought it would be a complete squeaker, nail biter, just right. Yeah. So. Um, um, so what I think the Episcopal Church learned is that uh, you can grow in a way that, that feels really hard, but it's not going to kill you. And in fact, it can make you better. And uh, mercifully, we've then expanded that kind of inclusion uh, so that uh, not only, I mean, we've, all, you know, we've had women uh, clergy and, and women bishops and all of that for a while. But um, uh, now it is the canon law of the church that transgender people um, can be clergy uh, and be bishops and so on. Uh, we don't at the moment have a transgender person uh, in a bishop role, but we've got a, a whole bunch of priests. And, and people have had the experience of being so opposed to something, and then when they meet someone who who is that thing that you've feared and doesn't look fearful at all or, uh, you know, scary, uh, that it changes you. And I think uh, that's certainly not been a unanimous um, experience. And there are still people who uh, disagree with what we did right. and, and so on. But for the most part, uh, we're done with that. And it's really nice to be on this side of it. And it, I, I, I'm so sorry that, that the Methodist Church, as an institution, is not on the other side of it yet, uh, that they can put it behind them and be about the work of the church. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that there are places like Foundry and, and many others, um, uh, much smaller places and much less well-known, um, can still offer a, a wonderful home. Uh, for those of us who feel marginalized for whatever reason. And right. Lord, the world is filled with marginalized people, right? Um, it's only straight white guys that, that you know, have to ob observe and, and, and think about what that's like to be marginalized. Because, uh, I mean, if I weren't gay, I would fill all of those categories. Me too. You know? And so what I'm so grateful about is this experience has given me the tiniest window into what it's like to be a woman, to be in a wheelchair, to be a person of color, uh, you know, all of that. Um, so, uh, you know, how could I be anything but grateful for that? Right. No, it's interesting you said about the Methodists, because um, I have friends who are like, well, how could you be part of that church? And so I believe that it's going to change. I it think will. it's actually going to change much sooner than later. I think very soon, quite honestly. Um, and I think that you have more power to be inside to make the change than this to just quit. Well, and what I was saying about when you meet someone who changes your, you know, so if you're not around uh, to meet those people, the, there's no chance of changing their minds. No. So I, I totally admire you for that. Yeah. Um, just a little bit, you have two daughters. I do. I've met, I believe. And two granddaughters. Two granddaughters. Um, and they're going to be here soon, yep. visiting D.C. So um, share a little bit about 
that like when you talk about your you have two granddaughters, like what is your hope for them? What what life lesson would you have for them? So, you know, it's uh, w one of the things that is true now that I don't think was true when when I came into the world is that uh, the world is just changing at breakneck speed. Right. And I forget the figure, but there's something like, I don't know, you know, at least half of the jobs that exist today or at some point didn't exist 20 years before that. For sure. So when I think about my granddaughters and, and their future, uh, you can't think specifically like that because uh, they're gonna be living in a world uh, very different. Who knows in what ways, but very different. So what you're left with are, are values and so on. And I think, um, you know, this, this experience that I've had um, has been an experience for my family as well. Um, my own daughters, my own granddaughters. And, and so I think the, uh, the in inclusion just goes a long way as a value. But my, my younger daughter, Ella, uh, when she was in the sixth grade, she was at a, a small little country, uh, sort of a hippie <laughs> uh, school, and uh, some guy came in to teach them how to make a dugout canoe. And he s made some kind of homophobic, you know, negative anti-gay remarks. And at, you know, the sixth grade, she went to the head of the school and demanded that they make him come back and apologize. And she got the whole class organized and he came back and apologized. And she's like, you're talking about my father. Right. So like, stop that. Right. No, that's also, it's also true if you're in Florida watching this, right? Right, gay, 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 right? And the other night on the Academy Awards, they were like, and this is gonna, we're gonna be gay, 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 gay tonight, right. Florida. Right. No, it's so true. It's so true. And it's also really wonderful to be in D.C., which is uh, um, filled with uh, many, many uh, LGBTQ people, uh, many of whom staff Congress. I mean, if, every, if they all stayed home one day, they'd have to close down Congress. Right. It just wouldn't function. And um, so it, that, it's a lovely thing. I think a lot of people from a lot of those more conservative states want to have those jobs because it gets them out of that and they can be themselves here, For sure. which is a, 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 a great advantage of being in D.C. So you've been here for a while, like 10-ish years? Uh, yeah, I moved here in 2013, so 2013. nine years. It was starting my 10th. Uh, and I almost instantly fell in love with it. So that's what I was going to ask you. Why do you love D.C.? What is it about D.C.? So uh, New Hampshire is the second whitest state in the Union. So it's just so great to have regular, ongoing contact with people of color because uh, it's a different perspective. And the, the more perspectives we have, the more people that are at the table, the better off we are. I, I just believe that. Um, I love hearing uh, 30 languages spoken in, in a day. Um, I, I love the height restrictions here. Mm -hmm. And and you and I live on the street that caused the height restriction. The Cairo uh, building over here, two blocks from us, um, uh, I guess uh, all of Dupont Circle went wild when they put up right. this. I don't know, thirteen stories or eleven, I think twelve, it's fourteen, something like that. Uh, but they were they were afraid that it this would become a, a city of canyons, the way Manhattan is and. You know, most downtowns have skyscrapers, and uh, and so they uh, this height restriction uh, ensures that the uh, buildings on the street are in proportion to the width of the street, and there's a formula for that. And but what it does is, and I think people super undervalue this, uh, or just don't even notice it, is that you can see sky no matter right. where you are. No matter where you can be on the tiniest street in D.C., and you can still see the sky, and uh, and that's that's the height restriction, and I think it it makes this city unique, uh, at least one of the ways in which it's unique, um, and I love it. Right. So I and I just want to go back to New Hampshire one more time because that's a very special place. 
Yeah. Right? So the, the, the people there that surrounded you and supported you, and maybe that was an aha moment that might have only happened there at that moment in time. What would you say to those people that surround you and wrapped you in love and support during that time? Well, so, I mean, we were in constant con um, uh, conversation, and uh, I, I just couldn't believe how committed they were. So, so remember I told you that I needed uh, consent from the clergy right. and lady of the, of the wider church. Uh, they, they decided before that convention and that vote that uh, if I wasn't consented to, they would elect me again. And then if I wasn't consented to, they would elect me again until, until the church relented and let them have the bishop they wanted. Of course, you know, one of the things I love about New Hampshire is the people are just totally cantankerous and ornery. And the, nobody was going to tell them who they could have and not have right. as their bishop. Live free or die, right? And live free or die, which is right. part Movie. of the name of the film, uh, the second documentary, Love Free or Die, is a, kind of a take on that. But they, um, uh, they, were, it, uh, they kind of fiercely uh, defended me and uh, were, were on my side. Um, you know, during that Lambeth Conference in England, which lasted for three weeks, um, uh, I had calls back to the diocese, and people would gather to express their support to me over in England. Uh, that kind of thing. They just, uh, um, they were just really quite amazing. Good people. Um, speaking of people, um, you've met some amazing, interesting individuals. You talked about President Obama, right? Yeah. Who are some of the key figures that you could share that were just, that you can't, I'm, I can't believe I'm in a situation, I've met him or her, or I'm, I'm having dinner with, like, tell us something that's like kind of an interesting little behind the scenes. Well, so um, uh, I didn't get to spend a lot of time, but I, I did spend a piece of significant time with Desmond Tutu. And praying with him was a, a, just an astounding experience. I mean, uh, in my opinion, it, he's about as close to God as you can get, right? And, uh, and he loved people the way God loves people. And so that was, that was amazing. When we were uh, uh, premiering uh, the documentary in uh, London, um, someone said, well, we ought to get somebody, you know, famous here. Uh, and someone said, let's get Ian McKellen. I said, you get his phone number and I will call him. So, so I mean, this is like Sir Ian McKellen. I mean, he's like, that you know, man. the X-Men and uh, uh, Lord of the Rings and Gandalf and all that. So, so I call him up. And, uh, and so he's like, why don't you come over for dinner? So I, I pictured, you know, there'd be somebody, a cook in the kitchen. No, he cooked me dinner, and we, we just instantly hit it off. And we were finishing each other's sentences, you know. So he's, he's been a, a, a dear friend. And uh, um, every time I go over, he, you know, he has a dinner party for me or, or whatever. He, uh, once I was there, and he, he said, have you seen the new uh, exhibit at the National Portrait Gallery in Trafalgar Square? And I said, no, well, what is it? He said, well, it's called Gay Icons, and you and I are both in it. And uh, I said, have you seen it yet? He said, no, let's go. So, so we, all, we went off to Trafalgar Square, and of course it freaked out the people who were there right. seeing the exhibit to see us walk in, and then they all wanted their picture beside our picture. Anyway, um, uh, so he's, he's uh, uh, so effervescent and lively, and so he's 10 years older than I am. And, uh, and he's just done so much good uh, for LGBTQ people. And um, he's just uh, a, a generous, uh, wonderful, and unbelievably talented man. That first night when we had dinner, uh, I said to him, so would you, be, oh, so we're sitting, and he's like, we should have music. Let's get Elton. Elton John. John. Yeah, yeah. So he's, he's like, he just picks up the phone, and he's like, Elton, so what are you doing on July, two, you know? So, <laughs> and then uh, uh, he's like, 
we should have it in some place nice. He said, how about um, Royal Albert Hall? I'm like, OK, that'd be fine. <laughs> so anyway, it was uh, it, just being around, it was really quite amazing. And um, uh, so uh, who else? Um, uh, it was because I enjoyed The Daily Show and also Colbert's show so much. It was uh, a joy being on that. It was, it was actually the night of, of the inauguration that I was first on The Daily Show. So it was a live feed from, from here in D.C. Uh, to, to New York. And um, probably the greatest line I've ever come up with in my life uh, happened just completely out. Because you have no idea what they're going to ask. And this was live. Right. Right. So, and I think Jon Stewart, the last thing he expected was for a bishop to be funny. So you were sassy. Right. Right. So, so he, he starts out with the with the observation that it must have been really hard moving around and, and all those people, you know, two million people on the mall. Uh, and especially hard for you, Bishop Robinson, because, well, you're, you're a bishop and bishops can only move diagonally. You have to know chess right, to chess. know that. Uh, I did at least know that much about chess. And somewhere out of the blue, I responded, uh, yes, John, but you have to remember there's also a queen on the board. He nearly fell out of his chair. It was so much fun. Right. Um, and then, then uh, later I went to the studio and uh, did another interview with him. And Stephen Colbert is uh, profoundly religious. And uh, as a, a matter of fact, a mentor of mine married him and his wife. Um, he's a Roman Catholic, of course, and, but she's Episcopalian. And uh, so we had that in common. Um, but he is... Uh, so thoughtful and um, uh, um, uh, kind of a, a deep person, which is why I think probably his humor is so good, um, because it, it's not mindless. It's, it's based on having thought through whatever those issues are. Um, but um, so the, the funny thing that he did during that interview, every time I said the church, which, of course, you know, I was on, because uh, uh, I had just written a new book, right. and, uh, you know, I talked about the church a lot. And every time I said the church, he said, the Catholic church. I said, oh, no, not the Catholic church, but, the, you know, the church. God. As, right. uh, and he would, he would insert Catholic. Every time I said it, it was so funny. It was both irritating and hilarious. So, anyway, people seem to... Uh, uh, seem to enjoy it. Um, I uh, got to spend time with um, Jimmy Carter and his wife and daughter, uh, which was at a, at a book festival, actually, in, uh, on the border of Wales and England. Um, it was uh, very, very special. Uh, so yeah, it's been a, a great privilege to get to meet some of these. And, I, and Elton John, oh, whom God. I did get to meet, oh, my God. even though he, he didn't sing at the Okay, at the uh, premiere, right. uh, but uh, and he knew all the story of right. what was going on with me. So I would have to say probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. One of the most um, heartwarming things and emotional things I've ever seen was Matthew Shepard. And so tell us a little bit about how that came about and what it meant to you to be able to perform that. And it was for his family, for him, and for the greater community. Yeah. So five years before I was elected bishop, Matthew Shepard was um, uh, beaten um, to within an, an inch of his death and left hanging on a, on a fence on the prairies of uh, Mon uh, Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming. He died uh, five or six days later. Um, a young gay man uh, uh, literally pistol whipped to death. And um, so the night of my uh, consecration, I got a note from Judy Shepard, his mother, saying, uh, I, Matthew, by the way, was an Episcopalian. And she said, I'm, I'm sure Matthew is smiling down on you mm. as you were consecrated a bishop. Uh, I, still, I still have the note, you know, uh, framed it. 
Uh, so I, I've known the shepherds. Uh, they've just done such great work. You talk about someone who takes a tragedy like that and, and turn it into uh, a wonderful thing. They've just done so much, uh, uh, so much good for LGBTQ people. Uh, and continue to. So I got a call in, uh, that was in 1998 when he was um, killed. And in 2018, 20 years later, I got a call from Judy and she said, you know, we've never buried Matt's ashes because we're, we're pretty certain that some of these hate groups would uh, deface and, and um, uh, you, you know, do, do something awful. Uh, right. with the grave. So we literally have never buried his ashes. And someone mentioned that maybe the National Cathedral uh, would be a place uh, that would be safe. And so I said, well, Judy, uh, you want me to talk to them? And she said, would you please? So, um, so I, I called up the dean uh, of the cathedral, and he was just instantly um, open and welcoming and absolutely this is this is the place for him and the crypt downstairs is is a place people can't get to so it fulfilled what the what the shepherds were looking for which was uh, a place that wouldn't be defaced and 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 so on because Matthew was there and then we began to talk about it sort of becoming a kind of a pilgrimage pilgrimage place uh, for people to come and think about uh, uh, all of that. So, um, so we did a service um, there at the National Cathedral, uh, at the end of which we uh, interred his ashes uh, down uh, uh, in the crypt. But I wondered, I mean, it, it had been 20 years. There were an awful lot of LGBTQ people here in D.C. who weren't even alive then or old enough to remember it. And I thought, mm, I wonder if any of them will be here. And uh, will, will people, well, the cathedral was packed. You couldn't get in. It was just packed. And, and I realized myself that there was something um, unfinished for me and for everybody. And, and we didn't even know it. Uh, uh, until we had this opportunity. And so, um, and I also, at the beginning of that service, I acknowledged that, uh, I knew, I, that I knew that there were a lot of people there for whom uh, it was a hard thing to walk into a church because for many of us, it's the church that has treated us so poorly and made us feel so badly about ourselves and, and that we've had to work so hard to overcome it. And so I, I wanted them to know that I knew how hard it was for some of them to come into that church. It's sort of like going, going back to an abusive spouse, right? Sure. And um, so I, I sort of welcomed them in that way. And anyway, it just turned out to be this healing moment uh, and healing in ways that, you know, for each person it was unique. but. Uh, I never, I never guessed that, the, that A, uh, there could be still so much pain around this event, and B, uh, how healing such an event would be. Because if you're an LGBTQ person and the National Cathedral, of all places, welcomes the ashes of Matthew Shepard, then they're welcoming you as well. And it, I think it, uh, while, while it is the Episcopal Cathedral for this Episcopal Diocese, it's also the National Cathedral. Right. And, and so it was not just any church that, that was welcoming uh, Matt, um, but the National Cathedral. And, and, and thereby, it became an event, I think, for our whole community. So, um, you know, sometimes you just get led into doing things, you, you don't dream them up, but you just say yes when an opportunity comes up. And, I, and you know, in some ways, I, I felt like I'd prepared my whole life for that moment. Okay. Uh, I've spent my whole life with one foot in the church and one foot in the gay community. And for that two hours, those two worlds came together. And it, 
it felt like everything I had experienced prepared me to be the right person to preside at that service. Right. Um, if you had to just say quickly, the world needs a little less and a little more, what would it be? The world needs a little a less. A little less demonizing. It seems to me that the, the terrible fissures we see in, in our society right now uh, comes from not dealing with another person as a human being, but as a demon of some some sort, a liberal or conservative or whatever, and it's going to kill us if we don't if we don't uh, get over it. Um, and so I guess uh, what I'd like to see the world have a little more of it's an old idea. It's it's ancient, really, but is is this notion of walking in someone else's shoes? not seeing them as a demon, but as a, as a human being, and, and realizing that you have far more in common with someone about, with whom you may completely disagree on a particular issue, but that you still share more in common uh, than that which separates you. And um, if, if we don't get back to that a bit more, uh, then, then we're in real trouble. Right. So thank you for doing this. This I'm, is great. I'm so glad. You that, should come over uh, anytime. Yeah, uh, no. It's, it's, I'm so glad we're neighbors and friends. And, and, um, and you're my real estate agent. I'm your real estate agent. I actually met you in this building. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to an open house because I rented the first year I was here. And I thought, well, I should buy something, not just pour money down a hole. And, uh, and I came to an open house that you were sponsoring. And I got an email from you the next day saying, uh, it. Uh, uh, you know, you, do, you didn't buy this house, but I'm, I have this other house. It's a condo on the market. Uh, we'll go on the market this coming weekend, but I can show it now. And uh, you and I met the next day, and I think we signed papers that day. Yeah. I mean, it was, and so, uh, and you've been a friend ever since, and helped me find this, this great place. Right. Yeah, I know it worked out. Kismet, right? Yeah. It's um, one foot here and one foot there, and yep. that's where you find God. Um, so if you had to say, you've done all this work, you've raised children, you were a good son, you've been a husband, you've done all these things. On your epitaph, what are three things you want people to remember Gene Robinson? What are the three things? Because you've mm -hmm. done a lot. What would be those three things that you think would be? Well, um, I mean, it would, be, uh, it would be embarrassing to have it on a tombstone or something, which I don't have to worry about because we have a little a new columbarium at, at my parish here in, in D.C. And uh, there's only room on the little plaque for, for the name. Perfect. And I like that. Perfect. I really like that. Uh, I would like, uh, I'd like to be remembered, uh, it to be remembered that I was a good bishop. Okay. I always said uh, uh, I was much more interested in being a good bishop than being the gay bishop. Right. Right. Um, I'd like to be remembered for being a good parent. Mm -hmm. um, my, my daughters and I have a, just a, a remarkable uh, relationship. I, I couldn't feel any closer to them. And, um, and I'd like to be remembered uh, for uh, playing a part in changing the church. And in changing our church, it, it helped other churches to go on that same journey. And there's still some that need to go there. Um, and it's been a very humbling and uh, wonderful uh, gift from God to, to have been used in that way. Right, perfect. Thank you so much again, Gene Robinson, Bishop Gene Robinson, Daryl Judy, Washington Fine Properties, another Casa de Amigos, House of Friends. Thank you so much. Thank you.